You tend to get your bubble and not realize there's a whole big world out there that's happening and flying by us in the real estate market. 81% of all people looking for a buyer's agent only shop for one. Hmm. They do not shop for multiple. So they're on your site. Hmm. That may be your one chance and your one at bat. And if you're not prepared because you didn't learn from the losses, that's how you, that's how you fail in San Welcome back to Nevada Realtors Today, your place for timely updates on the news and trends that matter to realtors in the Silver State. And now let's join your Nevada Realtors President, Brandon Roberts, and Nevada Realtors CEO, Tiffany Banks, for today's episode of Nevada Realtors Today. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we have the amazing Lance Billingsley joining us. Um, so over the last 20 years, he has gained deep knowledge of the real estate industry. Starting out as a residential appraiser, he made the move to become a licensed realtor and then opened his own real estate brokerage in 2013. He later merged with a larger company where they closed over $1 billion in sales four years in a row. And I know you've been a Tom Ferry real estate coach, and now you are in the title business. So before I go into any more information about you, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, that was thanks for thanks for reading that. I'm not one that ever really likes to talk about my resume, but I've done a lot of things. Been an appraiser. I'm a I'm a coach. I'm an instructor for the state. I have about 15 CE classes that I do for them. I help to run a make team and we launched Zillow offers for people who know what that is. When they were buying homes, they used us to kind of do that. There were five of us that started that. And then Zillow Flex, which is a big platform they do nationwide. They launched that with us as well. We got all those things going and then an opportunity showed up for me to help launch a title and escrow company. Uh, that was in January of 2021, and we did that. And just last month, hit number one in Arizona. So just growth and opportunities and moving fast and super exciting. And oh, by the way, I get to talk to all the really top level agents in Arizona about what's changes, what's going on. And, you know, Tiffany, you and I see each other at conferences and that information I get to bring back to our people um, that work with. And it's it's a tremendous value. And and I we don't see each other just in Arizona. I mean, you you've actually attended mm -hmm. events in Nevada. I think we met at our regional event a couple of years ago. But I see you everywhere. Yeah. You're always, um, you know, in the mix, talking to as many people as possible, and love the energy, love the high tops. We have that in common. And um, <laughs> and I think I'm actually at CMLS right now in Seattle. So all the national MLS people are in are here. So. The, the Nevada group has actually spoken up a few times in different conference rooms. They kind of put you in almost like out room, almost like an Indian yeah. style. And and there's always Nevada people and Colorado Region 11 people for sure are always well represented. But yeah, we're in Seattle right now. That's why I have my TV background. That's great. And <laughs> so when you actually, let's just, I have a question. So for those that don't yeah. get involved in going to these conferences, going to these events, like why are they so vital to mm. your success? I, I would actually ch challenge that my career wasn't in the spot that I, I did. Well, let me take that back. My career hadn't gotten to where I didn't realize it could go to, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I was doing well, but I kind of in the team that I was running and the groups that I was running with, I, you kind of get in that bubble, right? And especially as realtors, we get a no community or we know our subdivision or we know this area really well. And when you realize there's a whole big world out there, and that's when my career changed, just when I started going to the conferences. And um, I'm, I'm the treasurer of our RMLS, our largest MLS here in Arizona, and they allow us to travel. And they actually take care of our travel prices or travel expenses, which is great. But my career has gone to a different level because I got to network with people like you, Tiffany, or I got to meet other presidents or other AEs or other, you know, people like Brandon. Those guys are everywhere at, at different conferences, right? And they're all looking to network. And not so much happens in the classrooms or in the conference room. Mm -hmm. It's the dinners and it's the, you know, the lobby. Those kind of conversations have expanded my career tremendously. And if a person is listening to this, I'd very much encourage if something happens in Nevada, like in Min Vegas, you don't have to travel and you don't have to fly. What a great opportunity to work and get to know people that are in the industry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Brandon, 
let's let's talk to him a little bit about what we've been discussing as far as appraisals have gone and mm. with the settlement right you you yeah. have Brandon can you kind of go into you know what I'm talking about right because I think it's come up will an appraiser know how much the true value of a property yeah. is in this new world yeah now that they've got um now that MLSs are not advertising compensation and many are not advertising what that compensation was paid in the thing. Our appraisers, or how do you think appraisers are going to determine the value, not knowing full concessions paid on a deal? Yeah, well, it's it's going to be very much like it was before, Brandon, in this term. And is I may have known the compensation, but that that was it wasn't atypical, right? Every transaction had had compensation involved in that, mm -hmm. right? So I could just fairly assume I'm gonna have to make adjustment for one percent, two percent, five percent, whatever that number was, because it was kind of normal. Now, if there was an adjustment due to concessions, that was always acknowledged in, in the listing, right? So I could take that number and I could tell the underwriter, here's this is this this group got five grand back, this house got ten grand back, this house got none back, and here's what I see adjustment for that. That that was there. Now I don't have that, right? To your point. Mm -hmm. So I have to only go by what it records at and assume that compensation is involved or not because that's typical now, right? Mm -hmm. It may or may not be involved. It, there may have been a 30,000 concession and there may have been a $3,000 concession. Right. Yeah. So how it are you going like to know that? A, As an appraiser, right? it, how are looks, you Okay. If I see a gross number that it's one closes for five minor, one closes for five hundred five, or one closes for four seventy five, okay, I would I would make the call to the agent who closed four seventy five and explain the situation I'm in and go, hey, was there an extra compensation or an extra concession, or what happened on that that I can report to an underwriter? It's the same as you mm -hmm. did before, but now there's an extra phone call, right? There's an extra, and and to your point, Tiffy. The, the conversations between all of the different people that are involved in the transaction now needs to be so much more amped up, mm -hmm. right? We have to have better communication with the appraiser, with the lender, with title, with escrow, with the home inspector, like all of those things or else we're flying blind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that that's the best that an appraiser is going to be able to do right now, for sure. I mean, I actually so know... Really yeah, to hear that you're saying that, because I think that makes at least agents, I, I even know, I don't know if it was your office, Brandon, or an office we visited, that came up a lot, that question of like, how are appraisers going to know, you know, what the the price is versus what the concession is? And they're typically the least like person in the transaction, quite frankly, because right. having been on both sides, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I joke, I've joked for years that I'm on both sides of the fence. And a, just don't like appraisers because they think they're there to screw up the deal. Mm -hmm. And appraisers don't like agents because they think that they don't know enough or kind of get in the way or, mm -hmm. you know, some of that that mm -hmm. interactive has not always been good. And I I was doing appraisers back prior to the meltdown in 08. So communication mm -hmm. was even back then not great. To the point that I said at the latter part of that, Tiffany, is never more than now for a realtor who's listening to this, do their ancillary partnerships matter? Mm -hmm. The idea of the idea of Brandon owning a real estate brokerage and saying, or more, more importantly, a team. If you own a team, a lot of, I owned a big team. And what happens is you have this lender go, give you $500 for your CRM. And this lender go, we'll give you $500 lead generate for you. And this lender go, we'll get all of those happen. Then when I get to the time to actually deal with who the lead goes to, I may have not used that lender in six months mm -hmm. and I don't know their processes and I don't know what, I don't, we don't even answer the phone from me because I'm not high enough of a priority. Mm -hmm. Right now we're in the spot that you cannot afford to jump around to lenders and different title partners. You have to have consistency, right? Mm -hmm. The title company more than ever has to know, is there a buyer broker? Who's paying the compensation and what's the CDI say, mm -hmm. right? But lender, you have to know if I'm going to ask for commission and concessions in, in our state, it's in the contract that it's at the discretion of the lender. So if mm -hmm. I don't have a lender that I even know, and I'm going to represent Brandon, and I'm going to use Brandon's cousin's best friend who's going to give him a, a one a one half of a point break on the price 
throws our relationship into a mess because the lack of predictability becomes a mess. And I would encourage people listening to make sure that they stay loyal to the partnerships. And if those people aren't answering the phone calls on Friday night at nine o'clock because you need an answer, move on. The $500 they give isn't worth it. Really? Answering calls, you guys work on the nights and weekends, <laughs> well, and then you go to concerts on a okay, wait, what, last night, Monday night. Is that where uh, you were at a concert on a Monday <laughs> night? <laughs> I went and saw a Green Day last night at at, okay. at T Mobile's baseball field. Great, it was awesome. That's awesome. You you know my love for music. <laughs> That's awesome. Brandon Brandon works a little bit harder than that. You were working last night, right, Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I like sport sporting events a little bit more than concerts, but yeah. uh, I spend a lot of time at our T-Mobile Arena where our nights play a yeah. lot. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the biggest challenges for agents going into this new transition with the settlement was was the the fact that they were going to have to communicate with each other more yeah. and actually pick up the phone and um and and talk instead of text and email and stuff. So. It's it. I always thought that was going to be a major challenge for appraisers. And when this first went in, it seemed like we had a lot more calls from appraisers and they probably weren't getting calls back. Um, but uh, I, I think we'll work through it for sure as we as we learn. Um, I'm kind of curious. Um, so you opened your own brokerage in 2013. I, too, opened my company in 2013. I've been in real estate a lot longer. Um but, you know, and there's a lot of lessons you learned. Can you share some of the uh, lessons you learned is starting your own brokerage back then? So I, yeah, I came actually, it, it, my brokerage, I partnered with a good friend of mine and we left the brokerage we were at. It happened actually in 2010 and 2013 is when I launched my team. So back in 2010, um, it was just more of that when you start your brokerage is I now can control distribution. I now can control my own liability. I now can control my own money. I can control who I bring into the family. All of that was great. The challenge I had, Brandon, is it was 2010, right? And what was happening in 2010? Nothing, right? There was nothing to sell because someone was buying homes. I, I, I wasn't even appraising homes, Brandon. I went to the largest bankruptcy attorney in Arizona and said, I will do BK 13s for you all day, every day, and I will charge pennies at the dollar. There was an adapt or die kind of mentality for rebranded. So to answer your question, yes, those were the reasons that we launched it. The problem was there was nothing, no, the agents were falling out quickly. There was nothing to really give me a chance, right? So then the team thing kind of happened in 13. And that's, I saw this, I've always kind of looked on the horizon to go, what's coming? What can I, what can I get ready for? And back to your original question, that's a great thing as your own broker. If I can get ahead of what's coming. And now today's as a broker, biggest challenge I think right now, Brandon, is are you a tech company? Or are you a sales company? Or are you a marketing company? And most of the big super teams that I work with are all, they all would say we're a tech company. We just happen to do real estate. As a broker now, I think that's one of the biggest challenges you have for the people that are listening is, you need to figure out which one you are, right? Sales is how you do it. And that's that's the skill that I can get better at. I can practice and I can script play and all that. But in the marketing and the technology, am I looking far enough down the horizon that I can say, oh, this is what's coming or this is what we don't need to spend money on? Because that's another big problem for brokerages now. That's why the day that I got at NAR IOI a couple of weeks ago was 80% of all brokerage owners are looking for a merger and acquisition opportunity. Why is that? Because of compression, because of marketing prices, because of liabilities. I don't want to get sued anymore. I don't want to be in a lawsuit. All of those things are super evident now, Brandon. Um, I wish I could answer your original question better, but I just never got a chance in it because the market didn't exist. Quite frankly, I was married at the time and I told my wife every day I was going to work and I went to a coffee shop and watched ESPN. Like that was like, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do? So I think, yeah, that, I saw the thing come in and, and redirected and that, thank goodness I did that. But man, for people that have brokerages now in your, in your case, Brandon, I feel for that because that is such a challenge, especially if you're a smaller brokerage, probably less than a hundred, 150 people. You, you're just in a, such a tight crunch right now. And in our market, they're all knocking on their doors all the time going, hey, do you want to sell now? 
if, hey, are you interested in are you interested in merging? I can mm-hmm. I can pay you three cents a dollar. It's the best you're going to get right now. Like all of that's happening. Yeah, one of our biggest brokerages in town, not biggest in terms of people, but in terms of volume, just got purchased last week by Compass. They just closed with Compass, so <laughs> that's happening in our market literally a week ago. In order to set yourself apart, you have to be keeping up with all these evolving times. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and gosh, it's not changing weekly. It's changing daily. It's it, There's an impact every day, whether you see it in Inman or Thousand Watt or Real Estate News or Swanapool or T3s, anything you can get information of, you can't get enough of it, especially as a broker owner now to go, oh, that's what's changing. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what I didn't see coming. And it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. You tend to get your bubble and not realize there's a whole big world out there that's happening and flying by us in the real estate market. Mm-hmm. That's why I think it's important. Like that's one of the things it's done for me to volunteer um with the associations and stuff. And one of the things of going to these these conventions and these things, traveling and meeting people is you get get outside of your bubble and you get to see that stuff. Mm-hmm. Brandon, my career didn't change until I volunteered. And this sounds like a, a, a this sounds like a, a commercial for it. But l- now, what I tell people every time I meet with whether it's ten people or hundred people, your career will change when you volunteer. And that answer is always, well, why do I want to hang out a, with a bunch of realtors? I'm a realtor, and they're all going to try and take my business or try to mm-hmm. take my secrets, or I can't. They're not going to tell me anything. They're surely not going to help me. I'm their competition. Mm-hmm. No. Competition isn't the people who are selling homes. It's not if Brandon is selling a thousand homes a year, he's not my competition. It's a thousand agents selling one home a year that is my competition. Hey. Right. So once I realize that and I operate that way, it it changes. But on the association and the volunteer side, once I was able to network with people and really see what they were doing well or not, mm-hmm. allowed me to to really change my com- my conversations with people. I was able to go, oh, well, I may not represent a property management situation, but I've got four people on my phone that I happen to know from the association that I can do that, right? And, mm-hmm. and that's the thing that we really, really miss. So if there's people listening, especially you have you know, volunteers on this call with me and with Brandon and mm-hmm. Get get in get into your association and listen to them and get on a committee or professional development or something like that and watch what happens to your career. I assure you it will change if you participate in the change. Mm-hmm. Right. I think what's the quote about the busiest people? Give give things to the busiest people because I think you think, how would I have mm-hmm. time? You know, like I'm trying to build my business. I'm trying to make money volunteering my time, like what's that going to do for me? But I think that you actually see that you, again, not just being in the room, but having like having a seat at the table, like these decisions that are made, you know, like Brandon at the helm, like making these decisions on behalf of in consult with their committees and our leadership team, like, you know, the entire real estate industry right now, it's in our state of Nevada. And taking that responsibility like very seriously, right? And of course he could be like, I have my businesses. I don't need to have time, you know, I don't have time for that. But, and as he knows, you know, he doesn't even know what he signed up for. This is not just a (laughs) once a week or once a month show up at an event. I mean, every single day we're talking, we're navigating, like I'm looking at him for guidance. Like this is not just a, you know, a a part-time job. It's actually a full-time like commitment for some years, a few years, three, four, five, six years. On that, Brandon? Oh my goodness. You, you are a better man than me and Trent. <laughs> it just keeps giving. And, and the keeps on giving. It, yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's that, um, that pain that won't go away in your shoulder. Right. It, it's it. And now more important in this, as if we, as volunteers have to understand, there was always the, the realtor, we all, before we volunteered went, all right, I have to pay this because it's dues. I have mm-hmm. no idea where it goes. I have no idea what they do with it. And now we lose this big lawsuit. So now it's I've been paying this money and that's what I got. Mm-hmm. So now you're almost in you're almost picking pieces as leadership and volunteering of saying, no, no, these are all the things that we've been doing for you. The VA mm-hmm. thing, the, the VA mm-hmm. being able to take compensation, that doesn't happen without the NAR. 
And of course, not everybody is a fan right now. That's okay. That happens in relationships. We don't, we don't always have to like each other. We have to love each other because we're in this together, but we don't have to like what the other one does. It's family. But you, if you don't volunteer, you have no say in it. Volunteer and you get to the spot that Brandon is after years and years of volunteering on committees, I have no doubt, and being on a board and not being the president and not being the vice or whatever that means, that climbing that that metaphorical ladder and volunteering, you don't you can't understand what they're doing for you until you're in it, right? And now once you're in it, now we're picking up pieces and going, yeah, but I know we didn't work out this time, but we're working to make things better. I'm working with the CEO. I'm working with the locals. I'm working with with Kevin and the guys at, at National. We're trying to get things right. You just may not see it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Get in our pack. Get in Ray pack. Like get in all the stuff, right? We've had a lot of those conversations lately about sharing our wins because oftentimes we just know, like we advocate for independent contractor status or to make sure that in Nevada, there's no sales tax on services. So sales tax on commission. But what does that really look like? Or, you know, during COVID, making sure that you're essential or making sure that your client can still conduct business and still have an open house and all these different things. And so You think about the work that we do for the consumer as well. And that's the majority, overwhelming majority of who we represent and and what we do. But we don't share our wins enough. You know, we we because we don't want to come off. But but maybe we need to share. Like, actually, Brandon and I have had a lot of those conversations lately. People actually want to see how the sausage is made. We think that we're protecting them by like, you don't want to actually hear how we got here. But they're like, we do. We do want to hear. Like, tell us. Yeah, that it, 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 I mean, as simple as the new, all the new contracts that everybody had to rewrite, mm-hmm. right? You can't, that protects, that protects the aid as much as it does the public now. Mm-hmm. We didn't necessarily have that before, right? Right. But really, in, in, in our contracts, the buyers always protect first and foremost, right? That's the, that's the job. It wasn't there to, to protect the realtor per se, right? Now we have clauses in there that say, Here's, I mean, every meeting that we guys, that we, every one of us have in volunteering, we have to, we have to read the, the, the clauses before we even can start them. So everything is better. Mm-hmm. It's just harder, mm-hmm. right? It's better for the consumer and better for the realtor, but it's just harder for both than it, than, than it had to be, but it needs to be. So we actually have a question. Do you know which question that is, Brandon? The one from one of from our Taylor? special Nevada uh, Nevada members who you've coached with. It's under Industry Insights number six. Yeah. So, so Jeff Saylor wanted us to ask you, what is one of the craziest things you had coaching clients do to make uh, to help make your point on uh, wasting leads? Wow, this sense. is really. Who said this that? is actually hey, we dug into your into the your history. <laughs> we found uh, yeah. a former coaching client of yours. Oh Nevada. <laughs> Jeff you, and I'm guessing oh this is gosh. an inside question. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you a great story. Um okay. so Jeff, Jeff is a dear friend, and um he was a coaching client that I had when I was coaching for Tom. And he was trying to figure out where he was going next. And and he should I hire an assistant? Should I should I get a buyer's agent? What's good? What am I going to do? And I said, Well, what are you doing right now? And he said, Well, I'm generating all these leads and they're coming in, but there's so many I can't convert. And I go, Well, so how often do you practice? Like well, I don't. I just they come in and if it's a good one, I can. And again, he was early on in his career. If it's a lead, I convert. If it's not, I just put them in in the pile. Right. So I challenged him and I said, <laughs> It's great that he brought this up. I love it. <laughs> I said, Jeff, here's a challenge for you. I want you to go out with your wife on Friday night. And I want to take two $100. And he was making great money. I want you to take two $100 bills. And I want you to take them out of your pocket. Don't say a word to your wife. Crumble them up and throw them in the street. And don't go pick them up. (laughs) He goes, well, why would I ever do that? I said, because you do that six or seven times a day when a lead (laughs) comes in and you pay at that time, it was 80 bucks a lead. I mean, they weren't like now they're 10, 12, 15 bucks. Right. It was $80 a lead. So I said, you do that six or seven times a day when you're not prepared for that phone call. And when a person comes in, you just go, oh, well, if I can help you, let me know. You just threw away a $100 bill. 
So he did that in front of his wife. <laughs> and on our very next phone call, I went, how'd that go over? And he goes, she looked at me like she wanted to rip my face off with, what are you doing? Why are you just throwing money? And he had to explain what the process was. And I ran into at one of the, uh, and then I also ran into a regional 11 and he still tells that story. And for the people that are listening, it may be 40 bucks, but every mm-hmm. time that phone rings, it's an at bat. Mm-hmm. And if you are not prepared in location, if you're not prepared with your 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 script of what you're going to say, we all kind of know the question that they're going to ask. If you don't prepare for yourself for that, you just threw away 40 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever it costs you per lead. And that changed Jeff's perspective, I think. And mm-hmm. for him to still tell me that story shows its impact. Mm-hmm. And at the time, what was $200 to a guy that makes very good money at the time? I don't know what he does now, but I'm sure it's better. But $200 is still $200. And that that's that's great that he brought that up and had you guys ask that story. And a shout out to Jeff. Good man. So, so, so what you're saying is he wasn't able to convert. Like, is that like summarize what yeah. what was his problem in that moment? Like, like so for those All these leads were coming that may in. feel yeah. stuck or maybe paying for leads, but but they're not able to capitalize. Like, wh- what's their problem in the moment? They're just not prepared. Go into that. This, I is, think, this isn't my world, but I want to understand. No, two, good question, Tiffany. I think there's for, for your listeners, there's two things that that matter. Our brains are not meant for sales, mm. right? Our our minds are meant to protect us. Like I, if if I said, hey, go run into that wall as fast as you can, mm-hmm. you're not going to do that because your mind is going to say that's hurt, mm-hmm. right? Now I may go, I'll give you twenty thousand dollars for you to do it, and you go, well, okay, it'll hurt, but it won't hurt that. So now you're tr- you're tricking your mind that the pain won't matter as much. We are not built for sales because we're told no over and over and over and over again because that's that's the nature of the business. The average, the average conversion rate in the United States is a little less than 2%. So for every 100 people like you, 98, 99 of them are going to tell me no, and that may be the polite version of what they tell me. So if I'm not built for that, I just want something easy, mm-hmm. Right. Instead of going, I had 10 calls today and I didn't convert all 10 of them. Am I going to listen to the recording and see what I'm doing wrong and see what I can change and reef my script? Or I'm going to call my buddy Brandon and go, Brandon, listen to this and tell me what I did wrong. Mm. That's the ones that make it. The ones who don't go, man, okay, well, it's another call that they, of course they don't want to buy. They're another bad client. They're another bad buyer. They don't know what they're talking. It's always their fault. Hmm. That they're on mm. your site looking at your at your IDX or whatever your feed is. Mm. They're looking at your property. And the data says right now, 81% of all people looking for a buyer's agent only shop for one. Mm. They do not shop for multiple. So they're on your site. Mm. That may be your one chance and your one at bat. And if you're not prepared because you didn't learn from the losses, mm. That's how you, that's how you fail in San Street testing. So if you have ten of those calls, you Lance, and this was your industry, your business, you feel like you could do whatever it takes to continue the conversation to make those ten calls actually profitable. This perspective, Tiffany, is if I said. I'm going to give you $100,000 to go do something crazy, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Most people listening on this call, outside of illegal and immoral and all that, Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, go do something crazy. Mm -hmm. They would all do that. Mm -hmm. They would all do it without really even contemplating that was I was saying, you would go, you're going to give me $100,000 to strip down to my underwear and run down a Mm -hmm. main sheet? I'm in. Like There's people that would do that. If you have 10 calls come in, in the state of Arizona, our average commission is 10 grand per transaction. That 10 calls is a hundred thousand dollars that I was not prepared for mm-hmm. or didn't try at, or I mm-hmm. didn't have the right, the right mindset, the right location. Like I said, the right environment to be mm-hmm. productive. We're taking sales calls in our car with our kids in the backseat. What are we doing? Mm-hmm. Right? So, mm-hmm. and we have to remember no client ever, ever, ever. If you guys are listening, no human has ever woken up and went, gosh, I'm so glad that I'm a lead. Mm. No one wants to be a lead, mm. but that's what we call them. Ten leads. Well, they're humans. 
<laughs> and they have thoughts and they have and they're about to go into something that is one of the worst, the tra- scariest situations in their life. According to Zillow.com, second most scariest thing they're ever going to do mm. outside of death, a loved one. They're looking for a person. They're looking for one. They're on your website and you're taking a phone call with your kids at soccer practice. That's the difference for being the successful agent and being mm. the one who's just winging it. Mm. But won't they think that person is more relatable? Because, oh, I have kids too, and I'm at soccer practice making this call. No, Brandon's shaking his head. (laughs) You want to see how Stephanie and I'm in the background going, can you hold up? Who is this? What is this about? Well, I'm calling on 123 Flower Street. uh, Yeah, how about I call you back? I'm at my kid's up. That's what happens. That's normal. And it's on to the day? And and, and the data says they're moving (laughs) through you. They're Mm -hmm. going to wait for you. They're looking to go see one, two, three Happy Street tomorrow, oh. and you and put them on hold. Another thing, I don't know how it is in Nevada, but I don't know many realtors anywhere that are super great at answering their phone and returning phone calls. It's not a strength of the, <laughs> of the organization as a whole. Or reading it is emails. Not. Brandon, reading emails. Yes, Brandon, do you agree? Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I 100 agree. I'm I'm one of those. You know, it's like a. Remember the day you you rush home to to check your your answering machine <laughs> because you were out all day, and now it's like it's right there, and you don't even want to listen to them. Mm-hmm. But, and and and, they're, and the data says they want you, they need you, they don't care about this lawsuit thing. All of the data is telling mm-hmm. us that. So since all of that's going your way, how do you not give them the the amount of the amount of preparation? I mean, mm-hmm. Your fiduciary duty, one of the things of your fiduciary duty is reasonable skill and care. Mm-hmm. I can't give you either one of those if I take a phone call because I can't hear you. Mm-hmm. And are you the priority client or am I the priority realtor? Mm-hmm. This right? is great. And so I, I know, that's- Brandon, this is a lot of what I, I'm sure because I've been through some of your office meetings and and I know you coach a lot of your agents as well, but is this a lot of the same conversations that you have? Yeah, I mean, you have, yeah, you're having these conversations no matter what market you're in. It might be a little bit different, but mm-hmm. it's the same frustrations. I mean, we're dealing with people, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's the same thing. But thank you, Tiffany, for for getting this free coaching call in for yeah. us. <laughs> you're welcome. Are you writing notes? <laughs> Uh, we're recording this absolutely. okay this is the version of coaching <laughs> yeah what yeah. are other i think i think right now like well let's talk about the 13 percent, and then let's talk about some like yeah. really great tactical because i think you've actually already given our listeners listeners some really great tactical takeaways which we love um to provide them with but let's talk about the 13 percent podcast the idea behind that what you yeah. think sets the 13% apart from everyone else. Thank you for that. And by the way, thanks again for being on that a couple weeks ago. I appreciate you. Um, mm-hmm. I came with the third, well, I partnered, I created when we launched my title and escrow company, I created a learning platform that that I basically would give away to our clients and just okay. like, hey, I know what it's like onboarding. I know what it's like going, hey, you're a new agent. What do you do? So I actually went to Vegas and used Brad Lee's Brad Lee out there in Vegas at um, Lightspeed. I went out, set up with Brad, and I actually was on Brad's show, which was super fun. Um, but I set up this interactive training platform. And then fa- fast forward, it didn't launch the way I wanted it to because I put on my sales team and it just didn't catch. Okay. So I partnered with our largest association here in Arizona, about 25,000 members. Um, their CEO is a dear friend of mine, Roger Nelson. And I I, I said, listen, I'm going to give you guys this. I don't want anything back. I don't want no one's going to pay me for it. I paid for it out of my pocket. I just think it's the right thing to do. It's about a hundred different um, scripts and budgeting plans and all kinds of documents in it. Mm-hmm. I put eight CE out. I put eight hours of free CEs in there for them that are pretty just take it on online, turn it in, and get their certs. So we did a lot. And but the promise was I was going to do a podcast. So I figured, what? How do we come up with one? Like, how? What do you name it? What do you? What? Right. Mm-hmm. So. Just reading through the news one day, and I remembered that the NER, you know, I remembered someone had said that 87% of all returns fail by the fifth year, and 50% of them failed by the end of the first year. Hmm. I'm like, where have I heard that? So I typed it in, and lo and behold, the NER is who put that out. 
That wasn't someone else who said it, which you would think so, but the NER put out a stat that said 50% of people fail in the first year, 87% fail by the fifth year. And I went, and actually to test it, Finney, I put out a social media post and said, why do real estate agents fail? Mm -hmm. And I got, I got 200 responses and it was everything from they don't have leads or they don't have leadership or they don't have work ethic or they, they're lazy or they didn't get the right, all of that. And I switched to me that I was tired talking about the negative. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the positive. So I'm going to talk why you fail. I want to talk about why they succeed. Mm -hmm. And if we can take that 13 cent and change it to 14%, how many lives do we impact? Mm -hmm. Right? How many people's futures change or their kids get to go to school or they get to buy that house that they want or they get all the things that real estate provides you if you work your butt off, you can get to. So I went, let's just call it the 13% and let's get the best of the best on it. Mm -hmm. Let's put out there, hey, if you want to think your mind tells you you're going to fail, hey. stop thinking about failing. Stop going, how do I get with those guys? Mm -hmm. What is it that they're doing different? So that's where the 13% really, really came from. Mm -hmm. um, and we are about to shoot our 10th episode. We do it every other week. And I, I love it. Um, like I said, just this morning, I met with our, our, our I have lack of a better term, Matt's my, my production guy, yeah. our director kind of sort of, and just retooling it and changing it and making it better and getting doing the things that, that I want it to be. And quite frankly, it's just for those people in the association. It, mm -hmm. If it happens to catch the people that listen to it in Nevada or across the country, that's not what is intended for. Well, you do have some Nevada listeners because I was on. So yes, yeah, I love it. That's how Jeff connected. He's like, wait, how do you two know each other? So, that's you, know, so you, actually, good. you actually, you know, said some interesting things about using these exact words. But when we've talked to some of these leaders, like the ones that are the most successful do not have a scarcity mindset. They're all mm -hmm. about like, here's my playbook, like similar to it sounds like what you created. Like, here it is. Go do this and go do it better. And yep. I absolutely think that like having that kind of mindset of abundance and sharing, what can I do? And also like bringing other leaders up and, and seeing, and I know that's probably a lot of what coaching is about is like making sure that somebody doesn't, you know, sees their blind spots or has the tools to be successful. But I think all of that and switching the mindset of like, you can be part of that 13% and leveling up, putting yourself in a room. Like I never want to be in a room where I'm the smartest person in the room. I never want to be in the room where I'm not inspired by others. Like I love being in the room with people of differing views. They can just, you know, I'm like, what can I learn in this moment from you that I might not have even thought about? And so I think that um, so much of what you described is actually like very like solid, I think great, information that our listeners can take away of like continuing leveling up, continue to like people provide at least the ones that want to share. And I know Azim, I'm going to give a shout out to Azim because Jeff, I think was in my leadership program years ago. They were in the same class and Azim Jessa, if you ever listened to this podcast, um, he, he has done a phenomenal job of saying, this is what has worked for me and like literally giving it to everybody yes. he can. Absolutely. And call me forever. if, Call me if you don't understand how that works or how can I help you? And that, I just admire that. And to me, immediately, that's a leader. Immediately, that's somebody I'd want to work with in a transaction. Like you just see those qualities in somebody that you'd be attracted to and somebody that you'd want to work with. The sum of the five people that we surround ourselves with, that's professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to be the same five, right? Mm -hmm. Or early are they? And the five people you surround yourself with professionally you should be ranked fifth on the on the on the mm -hmm. top five, mm -hmm. right? Go find those people who don't think like you and surround yourself with them and listen to them. And when they talk, don't laugh them off. They may have something that brings an advantage to you. And if they're not going to share their plan, like with us, everything we did was Zillow, everything. And we were we did four billion dollars four years in a row. So we were doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody that could walk in our office at any time and I would go, here's all of our SOPs. Every, every operating process we had, here's all of them. I'll make you copies. Mm. Because I knew deep down in my gut, Tiffany, they weren't going to do it because they mm. realized it was a heck of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't my fault. Right. I'm just giving you the plane. 
understand plays. If you can't put people on the line and run the play, then I can't fix that for you. I can I can give you the play. And I agree with you completely. Get around those people who are better and faster and think different and don't think like you. They're not. I, I try to not to surround myself with people that have no hair and gray beards. They're not thinking the way I want to be taught, right? I'm going to get, I, I started two years ago. I put out a post that said, I need a coach. And people are like, why would you want a coach? I said, I want a coach. And here's the rule. You have to have been in the industry less than five years. You have to be under the age of 25. And, and this is, has to be your full-time job. And I want you to coach me. Hmm. And I got aligned with a kid who was just coming in the industry. He found a niche doing probate and was becoming extremely successful, extremely fast. Hmm. And he went, if you coach me, I'll coach you. And we did that for months and months and months where yeah. I would just go, hey, what do I not see coming? Mm-hmm. What do I not? What's What do you hear up there that people your age are saying hmm. about our industry that I don't hear? Right. right? So. That, again, it's that mindset of going, I got to find that person. If they're not going to knock on, no 22-year-old kid's going to knock on my door and go, hey, how can I help you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and find think, one. I think even as like moving this organization forward, we're trying to you know come up with new and innovative ways to serve our members, make sure that the consumers know we're representing them. And and I love like a call that, that we had that I haven't even had time to share with Brandon and I won't go into on this call, on this podcast, but... I loved how like last week or the week before when I called you to use space in Arizona and you're like, actually, and also, by the way, I have a great idea for you as an organization because you know that like the desire to like move Nevada forward to be like a trailblazer and you're like, this actually, have you thought of this? Like breaking it down for me. And I'm like, yes, let me, but I want to have time to digest it. And I, again, that's something that I appreciate so much because it's somebody that's you know, not from the state of Nevada, but has all of this perspective on what's worked. And you're willing to sit down with our leadership team of like, you know, hey, I know that you want to be innovative. Here it is. But here's some ideas. It's, and, and, you know, on your boards, get someone that's not from your market. Mm-hmm. Get someone that's not a realtor. Mm-hmm. Get someone that's not over the age of 30. Get like those are the people who are going to impact you in ways that you don't realize. And it's back to we've talked about it multiple times. The bubble idea is we get in that boardroom and we sit there and we go, let's talk about this. And we get stuck in the minutia of a bunch of nonsense that doesn't impact or change anything. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, outside of our building, the world is is falling apart. Right? right. And there's lawsuits and all this stuff's happening. Like get those other people that are, aren't in the same mindset as you, whether mm-hmm. it's you, I, I said this the other day to some friends, if I'm at a brokerage and I'm not being productive, mm-hmm. change. Mm-hmm. If I'm on a team and they're not providing me the leadership that I require, because this is my career, man, this is a hundred thousand dollars a day that I get in at that at. And if they're not going to change the way I want you, you will fail because you surrounded yourself and didn't make the change. Mm-hmm. Make the change. Go find someone yeah. that is in that mindset. That's how everything in my career has gone. What's coming next and who's the person that I've got to go find. Hmm. That's how I got with George. That's how I got, that's, 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 that's how we built. We got Zillow, Zillow decided to buy homes because the owner of our company called its local rep and said, I know that offer had an open door doing it. If Zillow does it, can you have them call me? Hmm. And Lloyd Frank called him three days later and six months later, we had a team of five helping them spend hundreds of millions of dollars buying homes. Hmm. So like, just it's just that. Just go yeah. ask. Just go make a change, right? You are incredible. Brandon, do you have any last uh, last question for him? Yeah, one question. Are you going to be at uh, NAR Next in Boston? I will be, yes, sir. I'd love to buy you lunch. I think this podcast was too short. Uh, we didn't even cover half the things you've done in your real estate career, and yeah. I'd love to know more, so. I'm happy to do it. And anytime you guys need me, I'm happy to chime in. And um, all I'm missing is a class in MLS right now. So I'm not too worried about racing back to it. That's okay. It's okay. I love the time and I'm here to answer any questions, anything that I can help you guys with ever. And I, I think the world of Tiffany, I think she's great at what she does. You guys are blessed to have her. Um, and I only know her on the professional level of walking by and saying hi and going, hey, how are things going? So 
to that extent, I think she's incredible. So you guys are in great hands with her. Uh, Brandon, I would love to sit with you in, in Boston. I'll be there all week. And anybody you want to bring, we can have conversations and um, I'd love to do that. One rule though, Brandon, I have to pick out your shoes and we attend lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. I'll watch her Jordans just for, yeah. just for we'll, get, we'll get him some high tops. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lance. Again, you know how I think the world of you. And um, yeah, we'd love to maybe have a part two and get in when your when your mic is super solid and you're in your podcast location and you know really kind of dive in some like best practices that our members can do right now to really set themselves apart. But thank you so much for taking this time with us today. Of course, of course. You guys have a really good day and thank you for everything you do in, in for, for your agents. Thanks and check out the 13% podcast. Thanks, That's it. Man. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.